Good evening, I'm Sean Hearn, Executive Director of the Babe Ruth Birthplace Foundation, and I want to thank each of you for tuning in to this year's Birthday Bash. The Babe Ruth Birthplace Foundation relies on admission sales, memberships, donations, and special events like this to help fulfill our mission. By watching, sharing, and participating in this year's Bash, you are helping preserve the legacy of Babe Ruth and all of Maryland sports. On behalf of all of us, thank you. My name is Mike Gibbons. I'm the Director Emeritus and Historian at the Babe Ruth Birthplace Museum in Baltimore, Maryland, and I've been working down here for 38 years. It's been a great ride. Hi, my name is Claire, and I love to play basketball, soccer, and lacrosse. Hi, my name is Ella, and I like to play soccer and basketball and Batman. When I was seven years old, my father told me that uh, we were going to be going to the Orioles' very first home opening game. I had never been to a baseball game, I'd never been into a stadium, and the first thing that I see coming out of the ramp is this expanse of green grass. My first ball game was uh, Ravens, it was at Ravens Stadium with my dad. The first time I went to a ball game, it was a baseball game at the New York Yankee Stadium, and it was just with my whole entire family. There was a lot of commotion going on around the Orioles dugout, and I asked my dad, I said, what's going on down there? And he said, the Vice President of the United States is gonna throw out the first pitch. That was Richard Nixon. Baltimore was an industrial town. They built ships, and they built aircraft. Once the war ended though, in 1945, those industries slowly shut down and kind of dispersed and went away. The Babe Ruth story is woven into the fabric of what the American culture is. Who's Babe Ruth? The Bambino! He comes from the poor waterfront of Baltimore and goes on to become the greatest star in the history of sports. He is the all-American dream come true. Babe Ruth set 206 major league records. They had to change the way that the stadiums were configured. They had to move back the fences to accommodate for his power. I wish I had seen him play. This is a ball signed by Babe Ruth. He signed more baseballs than anybody else in the world. Somebody I did get to see play was a quarterback by the name of Johnny Unitas, number 19. My favorite Raven player is Lamar Jackson. My favorite Raven player is also Lamar Jackson. The year was 1972, the last home game of the year. The Colts are playing the Buffalo Bills. Unitas runs out onto the field. A little biplane flies over Memorial Stadium with a banner saying, Unitas, we stand. The fans are cheering and crying, screaming. Unitas calls a play. He drops back, passes for a 67-yard touchdown. One play, one score, and Unitas runs off the field for the last time. Unitas, we stand. This is his last touchdown pass. So when we think about Baltimore sports, we have to think about the college game too. First name that comes to my mind is head coach Gary Williams, University of Maryland men's basketball. It seemed like every year the Terps were in competition. He took them to the Sweet 16. He took them to the Final Four, brought the national championship here in 2002, Juan Dixon and all those great players. This is the net that Gary and his team cut down after the 2002 National Championship game. So why do we talk about these heroes? Why remember their names? Here in Baltimore and in Maryland, we can identify with our athletes and our teams because they come to represent what we are or what we think we are. This is who we are! Do you remember Earl Weaver, championship manager for the Orioles for so many years, but he is perhaps best known for a loss that he took in his last game before he retired in 1982. The Orioles were in a pennant race uh, with the Milwaukee Brewers. They come down to one last game in Baltimore, sellout crowd, and the Orioles fell flat, and they lost by a big margin. The fans were disheartened. However, we all knew it was Earl's last game. The fans started to chant, Weaver, 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 and we had 52,000 people standing, crying, chanting. We lost the game, and the crowd stayed. One of the great moments in Baltimore sports history. That's who Baltimore is. That's who we are. Babe Ruth Museum, just a long fly ball from Oriole Park at Camden Yards.
Good evening, sports fans, and welcome to the 28th annual Babe Ruth Birthday Bash. This tradition started back in 1995 when the Babe Ruth Museum kicked off a years-long celebration of Babe Ruth's 100th birthday on the actual day he was born, February 6th with the first ever bash over at Oreo Park at Camden Yards, just a long fly ball from the Babe Ruth Birthplace and Museum. I'm Katie Dick with Mike Gibbons, and tonight we kick off three evenings of virtual birthday bash programming. Panel discussions featuring the University of Maryland's 2002 National Championship season, the 2012 Baltimore Orioles, and three historic pitches thrown by former Orioles hurler, Jack Fisher. As part of this year's birthday bash, we are also offering an online silent auction with all proceeds benefiting the museum. The auction will end this Sunday at 9 p.m. We're dedicated to sharing our sports heritage with a wide audience, so these three nights of programming are free to our fans. To purchase a ticket for our live Q&A sessions, sign up at the link below. Tonight's bash program celebrates the 20th anniversary of Maryland men's basketball national championship run in 2001 and 2002. And here to take us through that magical campaign, head coach Gary Williams, center Lonnie Baxter, forward Chris Wilcox, and the voice of Maryland basketball, Johnny Holiday. Hi everybody, I'm Johnny Holiday. Great to have you with us uh, tonight on this very special evening to celebrate and remember the great run the Terrapins had back at the 2001-2002 season when they won their first ever national championship in basketball at the University of Maryland. Joining us tonight, Coach Gary Williams, Lottie Baxter, who was a senior in that team back in 01 and 02, and Chris Wilcox, who was a sophomore on that season back in 2001 to 2002. Coach, it's great to see you as always, and Lottie as well, and also you, Chris, out there in Arizona, enjoying that sunshine in Arizona. Good to I see you too, Johnny, man. Hey, Coach, I was trying to get out there too. <laughs> <laughs> Gary, as, as we reflect back on, on what happened to win that national championship, I think it all goes back to maybe the year before. When you got to Minneapolis and you faced Duke in that uh, semifinal game to get to the championship game, you had lost to them in Cameron in an overtime game. You come back and you beat them at Cole Fieldhouse. They got the best of Maryland in the ACC tournament. So you're going to play them for the fourth time. And you met them in Minneapolis and uh, did not win that particular game. And then I guess the guys vowed together, hey, next year, we love what we did this year. This is great. Let's take it one step further and win this whole darn thing next year. Uh, yeah, that, that loss in Minneapolis definitely um, left a, a bad sting in our mouth. Um, you know, we were up big at halftime. Um, some things happened in the second half, and we just weren't able to, to, to close out the win. So um, I remember after the game, I mean, everybody just, you know, we, we, we made a vow that we would be back on the, on the same stage, you know, to compete for a national championship the next year. And that's what we did. And, and Coach, he mentioned the fact that you were up by 11, I think 49-38 at halftime. Oh, yeah, we were up 20 uh, in the first half. Those, those four games with Duke that year, they were the four highest rated TV games in the country. Uh, they were just great games. Uh, we lost in overtime at uh, Cole Fieldhouse. Uh, Steve Blake fouled out with about a minute left in overtime and you know they, they came back and tied it up and it took into overtime so uh, and then they won a tap in in the ACC tournament we won at Cameron and then the game there and you know as Lonnie said uh, the second half was probably the strangest half one of the stranger halves I've ever coached it just seemed like every, every time the whistle blew all 10 players looked around at each other like what, what happened you know like nobody knew really what was going on with the, with the uh, officiating. But, you know, you have to win that game. And we didn't win the game. And so after the game, you never know how you're going to react to that. Maryland had never been to a Final Four before. So it was a great accomplishment just to make the Final Four. We lost a couple of good players from that team that, uh, you know, uh, and so the next year I wasn't sure 
if we would be good enough to uh, compete again for the national championship. But the players had this resolve, as Lonnie said, that uh, they were going to be good and give ourselves a chance to see if we could get to that level again. And, and Chris, you were, a, you were a sophomore on that, on that team that got to the national championship. Do you remember that first year when you lost to Duke in Minneapolis? Yeah, it's tough, man, because, you know, me being from North Carolina, I had to go back to it, you know what I mean? So me going back home and, and losing to Duke in the Final Four, it was tough. But, you know, man, it, it, it helped us for the next year. And I think that, you know, all of that was just growing pains for us. And then every game that we played them after that, man, we were just it felt like we just wanted revenge. We, we wanted them to feel that same feeling that we felt, you know? And it was tough, you know, like just like Coach said, we, we didn't think that we could get there, but at the end of the day, we worked hard. We put in the work. Even that whole summer that we, you know, led up to the year, a lot of guys really didn't even go home that summer. We stayed around this campus, you know, so we can continue to, you know, build our, you know, chemistry and stuff like that. But we had some good practices along the time too. So I think that's kind of what, you know, what got us to, you know, got gave us the motivation and got us where we needed to be. Coach, do you remember what you said to the guys in the locker room after that game? Yeah, I, I don't remember real well because I was in shock because we, we had the big lead and I thought we were going to win the game and, you know, some crazy things happened uh, in the second half. But also remember telling them that, uh, you know, th this this couldn't uh, – this this can't be the highlight of your life. You know, we got to go from here. And going from here meant getting to that next year. And like Chris said, the, the players were willing to work really hard. In other words – we had, we had great players, uh, one through nine, just incredible talent. Uh, our practices a lot of times were as good as any game we played because of the competition, and that made us a better basketball team. So the championship year, 2002, uh, we had earned a right to get back. In other words, nobody gave us that, and we, we had to earn the right to get back to the Final Four. And I think once we did, we just all decided that we were going to win the damn thing, you know, and uh, that's the way it worked out. When you started off the season, uh, you lost that first game of the year at Madison Square Garden to Arizona. And what was the feeling after? What was the feeling after that game for you as you coached that team? Were you saying, "Okay, uh, this is not the way we want to start. This is not the way we want to finish. This is not the way we will finish either." Yeah, I mean, I you know the basketball season. If you go a long way, probably thirty-five games. But at the same time, I think we were picked two in the country um, going into that game. Arizona had lost to Duke in the championship game in 2001. So they were really good. You know, Lou Dawson was a hell of a coach. And we lost by three. And, you know, it wasn't the end of the world. It was a neutral court. And I think for all of us, myself included, it's OK, we're going to have to work hard because the target's on your back now. You're a Final Four team from the previous year. Everybody's going to give you the best shot. Arizona did. They beat us by three. But we didn't lose many after that. And then you came back and you beat number two, Illinois, 76-63. Chris, you had a big, big game that night. You may recall 19 points and six rebounds against the Illini. Yeah, well, you know, I think all of that, man, just led – all the hard work we put in during the season, man, it just led up to that game, you know. And then during that during that stretch, man, every guy was needed for, for different things. You know, that night, you know, I was able to, you know, perform and able to get my team, get us to win, you know, and that's what we did. We didn't look at like, oh, this guy did this tonight, this guy. No, we all played together. Tonight might be your time to shine. And that's what made us so special, man. And, uh, man, like I said, that, it was a special team that we had. We all, you know, when we ever did something, we all did it together. So, you know, it was just the chemistry was always there, you know. So when we was going in the trenches together, man, we knew we had some dogs that we all we all was raised up together. Like, you know what I mean? Because we was all kids, you know. So, you know, we had to trust in each other. And when we went out there and we played, man, you seen it. You know what I mean? And, and then in the BB&T Classic, you beat UConn in the championship game, 77-65. Alana, you were the MVP of the tournament. You made eight of ten field goals. You went to the line 10 times. You dropped in eight of those babies. You had 24 points and t uh, 10 rebounds against them in that 77-65 win. What do you recall about that game? Oh, man, UConn, you know, I mean, they were just a, a hell of a team. Karan Butler, Okafor, uh, Ben Gordon. Um, they had tremendous talent. Um, we were playing, you know, at the, the Verizon Center. 
Um, it kind of felt like a, a, a home court game, you know, just being down the street. And um, like I say, we were really hungry and thirsty to get back to the, to the national championship game. And coming into that game, um, we just wanted to show how good of a team we were. Um, you know, Juan Dixon, Chris Wilcox, Byron Mouton, um, we all just played extremely well throughout that whole year. And that BBNT Classic, uh, it meant a lot, you know, because I think the year before um, we had beat GW and the MVP award went to um, Val, uh, Val Brown, <laughs> you know, even though <laughs> they lost the championship game, he still won the MVP. And, you know, everyone was saying I got robbed and, you know, this and that. But um, the next year I came out and I made sure that didn't happen. So. And coach, when you look back at that team, you, you know who the starting five was with Lonnie and Steve and, and Chris and and, uh, and uh, Byron Mouton and Steve Blake. And you, But then off the bench, you had Nicholas, you had Taj Holden coming in, you had Ryan Randall coming in, Andre Collins, uh, Calvin McCall, uh, the late Earl Badu also was on that team. And Mike Grennan, who was a freshman that year, only freshman to win an ACC championship and a national championship. Yeah, Mike Grennan owes me big time. You know, he, he does because uh, <laughs> the guys took care of Mike Brennan that, that year. And Mike Mike had uh, probably his bigger free throws I've ever seen for a guy that didn't play much in the uh, 2004 ACC championship game against Duke. He had to come in and he had to stick two to give us the lead in overtime. And he all net on both of them. So uh, Mike, Mike was great in practice because he could really shoot. You had to guard him, you know, and – I think that was the key in 2002, that second team, the guys you mentioned. In other words, Ryan Randall and Taj Holden would have definitely started for 80% of the college teams in the country. But because of Lonnie and Chris, they didn't start. So in practice, you know, when you scrimmage in practice, those guys were all looking to prove how good they were. So the first team never had it easy in practice uh, during that time because, you know, a guy like Drew Nichols could really play, could really shoot. Calvin McCall was just yeah. a great um, – Athlete out there in the court. By the way, Calvin McCall was, people forget, he was the ACC Offensive Rookie of the Year his freshman year playing quarterback for the that's University right. of Maryland. That's right. You know, and that's how good of an athlete uh, Calvin was. So we had a lot of guys in that team that were just uh, terrific because er everybody kind of knew their role, too. That, that's what I, I remember about the team. No, Nobody, you know, the, everybody knew when what they were supposed to contribute. And when that took place, we were the best team because we had the depth to be able to do some things like our front line was never in foul trouble because we could bring in Taj Holden. We could bring in Ryan Randall yeah. if Lonnie or Chris got in foul trouble. And when you started off in the ACC part of the schedule, you go to 10 and two with a quick run. It also ran your non-conference winning streak to like 84 best in the country. And you got your 250th win during that streak. And things were really going quite well, Coach. Yeah, I mean, it's um, we, we worked really hard um, as a program from 89, you know, through the, through the 90s, had some really good teams there. A couple teams I thought might have been good enough to get to the final, but we never did. And so when we did in 2001, that just changed, I think, our fans' expectations. That changed a lot of people's expectations. And Ourselves as a team, I, I think that was important. We, we built it the right way. We didn't take any shortcuts. And we just, you know, as a coach, I was just trying to see how good we can be. And I had a, a great staff, Billy Hahn, you know, Jimmy Patzos, Dave Dickerson, Matt Kavor, guys like that were all, all terrific coaches. And, uh, you know, just we, we were tight. We, we were tight as a team. In other words, you know, as a head coach, you got to be the disciplined guy. You got you got to be. You know, sometimes I'm sure players didn't like me, but at the same time, I, I always felt that we were mature enough to understand what we had to do to win. And I think also Lonnie and Chris, the players reflect the coach, and Coach Williams' attitude and philosophy and focus was always on, "We're better. We got this chip on our shoulder. You guys ought to have the same darn thing." And the senior leadership, when you won that national championship, Lonnie, and I can get your comment too, Chris, when you think back to Lonnie, were the first couple of years at Maryland instrumental in helping you develop that senior leadership with you and, and, the, and the other guys that were seniors that year? Uh, of course. You know, Coach Williams, like he said, um, <clears throat> Coach Williams is a tough coach. He, he shows you a lot of tough love. 
um, a lot of people can't really accept that. You know, a lot of people don't really understand that. But um, I mean, from day one, I knew what it was. And, you know, uh, coach always said, you know, that I, I was one of his favorites because no matter how much he yelled at me or screamed at me, I just looked at him and said, OK, and did what he told me to do. So <laughs> I was a guy to be in my feelings. I, I knew what I was at Maryland to do. Um, and, you know, that was to win a national championship. And, you know, God forbid we did that within four years. And it was just a, a great accomplishment. You know, me being from the state of Maryland, Juan Dixon being from Baltimore. Um, we just had a, a lot of pride in ourselves and coming out every night and playing for a coach like Coach Williams, who was always to do more with less. And Chris, you coming from North Carolina to play for Coach Williams, they didn't like you in North Carolina. They loved you at Maryland. No, definitely, man. You know, the crazy thing was I was prepared for Coach Williams because my high school coach, uh, Glenn McCoy, man, he was just like Gary. You know what I'm saying? So I was able to ad uh, adjust quick. But then I was just like, oh, this guy just I, I got it because it was just like he just wanted to win. You know what I'm saying? So then I start, once I understood that, it was just like, man, OK, cool. Let's go ahead and just do what this man say while we out here on the court. And then we are gonna have no problems with him. You know what I mean? But, you know, I loved it because, you know, he was always like that motivator. You know what I'm saying? Because even if you're doing good, when you go and you go by Gary, he's going to give you something that you did wrong. You know what I'm saying? Just, but it was like, it was, it was good criticism because it was motivation. Like, come on, man, I see what you're doing, but look, you should do this. You should do that. You know? So it was, it was motivating, but I just feel sorry for the guys that was on the bench. You know what I mean? Because they got <laughs> all the, they got all that pressure. You know what I'm saying? I was, te I was teaching, Chris. I was teaching. That was a teaching moment. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's what hey, hey Johnny, that's what got me off the bench. I said, listen, I got to get in the game some kind of way, man. I can't get cussed out. I can't get fussed out every possession because of them. You know what I mean? <laughs> oh man. A lot of truth to that. Um just because I expected Chris to make every shot, get every rebound, block every shot. Other than that, you know, it's that was like, it. <laughs> well, the goal was to win the ACC championship before you got to the NCAA that year. And Maryland had not won an ACC championship in 20 years, Coach. 20 years. Yeah, I mean, it's hard. You know, and most of the time you played down there in Carolina. So after the first round, all the tickets that were given by the losing schools to the other schools, you know, it was basically you were playing a road game down there. Uh, and so it was difficult to win. It's always been difficult to win in the ACC, but uh, it, it was great to get the win, but really our, our, our thoughts were on uh, um, bigger things by that, by that time, as we got toward the end of the season. And uh, I think we were uh, 15 and one regular season. We had lost that Duke and that was it, you know, uh, in 2002. And I'll never forget the last game in Cole field house. Uh, their last regular season game was against Virginia who was a good basketball team, and we scored 112 points, which mm. kind of was a statement that I wanted to leave in Cole Fieldhouse because there had been so many great players and great teams in there that, you know, I, I wanted to be considered the, the best team. These guys had deserved that, to be the best team that had played in Cole Fieldhouse. Lonnie and Chris, what do you remember most about that uh, first game against NC State? You had a little problem scoring in the first half. You came back and you won that game 72 65. Dixon went off, and so did Blake went off uh, to get that one over NC State. You have any thoughts, Lonnie? Uh, um, that game, um, I just remember we came out, we came out kind of flat. Um, uh, <laughs> I was waiting on Chris to answer because, you know, he's from North Carolina, and I'm sure he has <laughs> a lot more memories than me. I remember coming out flat, but uh, yeah, like you said, Juan had a great game. I mean, that's just the type of team that we were. Um, we were very resilient. Um, I mean, we could be down big and have some major comebacks because that's that's the type of team we were. Um, we weren't afraid of anybody. We weren't intimidated. And we loved the challenge, man. So that was a big thing. You know, the biggest thing was we just loved to go out there and just compete. So, and we knew one, you know, all we had to do was get one open and then, you know what I'm saying, the rest was, you know, it was done from there. So, and my job was just to clean up. So if Lonnie and them get open, I knew that the ball was going to the basket and I can get me a little rebound, a little tip in, some stuff like that. So, man, it was great. Well, Coach, on January 17th, you went to Durham, a tough loss against Duke at that point. Um, then you had big wins over Clemson and Virginia. 
uh, double-digit wins over NC State. You rolled through a had a seven-game winning streak, and you came back to Coalfield House for the second matchup against Duke before that great and it was a great home court advantage at Coalfield House. Yeah, here's here's how good our, our our players were, not just you know in terms of how they played, but before that game, um, player named Dunleavy, whose dad was a great coach in the NBA, good player for a long time. And Dunleavy played himself in the NBA for a long time. He had heard us down at Duke, and he was about 6'7", 6'8", could really shoot from the perimeter, not overly quick. But if he got a look, he, he usually could put it down because he was a great shooter. And the players came in. I think it was Juan, Chris, and it might have been Lonnie, too. They came in and said, Let, let's put Chris Wilcox on Dunleavy. And, you know, that, that's kind of out of the box because Dunleavy was really a guard. He, he was not an inside player at all. And... Uh, the more I thought about it, the more it made sense. And by then, you know, there was a, a tremendous amount of trust on our team. I think the, the players trusted the coaches. Coaches certainly trusted the players. And that, that's we, we just shut them down completely. You know, Blake had the great play at uh, halftime, stealing the ball from uh, Jay Williams. And we just dominated that game. But I think that really caught Duke off guard with Chris guarding, you know, their, their best shooter. Uh, and, and it took him out of the game, and they never really recovered from that. And, and you won that game, 87-73. And not only, Chris, were you on Dunleavy, but also you had 23 points and 11 rebounds in that game. And maybe did you maybe feel that maybe there's been a big weight lifted off your back after that went over Duke? Yeah, I mean, that was huge, man, because at the end of the day, for my teammates to come in and talk to Coach Williams about me guarding the best player on the other team, one of the top players on the other team, that let me know that my teammates trusted in me, you know what I mean? So at the end of the day, what I, my goal was to not, you know, and Delani know how we do. If somebody talks, somebody say something like, oh, the best player, we want to guard him because we want to shut him down. We want to prove them wrong, you know what I mean? Because at the end of the day, we was always the underdogs. They always were saying that, oh, Merlin, yeah, they okay, they okay, but look, man, we got something to prove the next year when we came every time we wanted we played duke man we had some, we had that chip on our shoulder man and that's what i felt every time that i play them being from home too you know it, and it, it it was just something that was needed for me you know what i mean and from then on man i think that for me that was a game to whereas i felt like that was my come out game because of my teammates being able to trust and believe that i can get the job done you know and you know coach i think people forget that you know, Chris was a heck of a defensive player as well as a heck of a scorer. Well, Chris had um, incredible timing, uh, not just as a shot blocker, but where the ball was coming off the rim. He always seemed to be able to get the ball at its highest point before other guys had a shot at it. And uh, Chris, Chris, I never paid Chris a lot of compliments uh, when, he, when he played but Chris had the intelligence to figure out, and great rebounders do this over the years. You, you pick up on this. Great rebounders have a feel for where the shot's going to come off. And, you you know, as you play basketball, I guess the experience of playing allows you to do that. But I, I always felt Chris had as good a nose for the ball as anyone because he just seemed to be, you know, it's not an accident. You're always in the right place at the right time for a rebound. It, you know, it's, it's a lot about positioning and, you know, checking your man and all those things. And, and Chris had that ability. It, it's always interesting when you go back and look at the number one teams that came into Cole Fieldhouse, and it was the seventh time when you beat Duke that particular game. That's the seventh time you had knocked off a number one team in the country. Yeah, well, the good thing was in the ACC, um, you, you had that opportunity. Usually Duke of Carolina was number one somewhere during the year, yeah. it seemed like every year. And, you know, it, it be, at uh, BC, you played against Georgetown, you know, all the time. And in Ohio State, Michigan was num – uh, and Iowa was number one in the country. So I, I got some shots at that. But the reason we beat them is because we were good enough. In other words, I, I never – I always felt um, – and I think this was good for me as a coach. I felt under-respected as a team because the uh, – a good example is we, we went to the Final Four – in 2001 and 2002 preseason, we were picked number two in the country. We were picked number one in the country, and we had the most guys back of any of those teams that had been in the Final Four. So, you know, th those things have a way of motivating you, and I think it motivated the players. So, you know, it worked out well for us, and we were never voted number one in the country during the regular season in, in the 2002 championship year. 
We have lost Lonnie Baxter for a couple of minutes. We're going to try to get him back on the Zoom with us as we continue our conversation. Let's go to March 3rd of 2002, the final game ever played in Cole Fieldhouse. And Coach, I looked up some numbers. In 13 of your 22 years coaching at Maryland, in Cole Fieldhouse, your teams were 155 and 35. You never, hardly ever lost a game in Cole Fieldhouse. Yeah, once we got started after those um, first three years or so, um, we definitely had as good a home court as anybody in the country. And that's because you have good players. You have fans that really got into the game. And the way Cole was built, you know, right in the middle of campus, 4,000 students sitting right behind the benches of the teams. And it's just, it was a perfect storm. Everything was there. We just had to get good. And, you know, the players through the years in the 90s, the Keith Booths, uh, you know, Dwayne Simpkins, Johnny Rhodes, uh, Joe Smith, Steve Francis, all those guys, we were gradually building to the point where we could beat anybody, especially in Cold Field House. And I think that's what happened. We just got into uh, a situation where we knew we were going to win every time we went out in the floor at Cole. It was really hard to leave there. It was hard emotionally for me because I had played there a long time ago, but I had played there. And that was kind of my gym is the way I looked at it. And um, I hated the leave. I really hated the leave. 47 years at Cole Fieldhouse. And that game against Virginia, I'll never forget that. You, you won that game 112-92 to 92 and uh, won the ACC championship as well that year. First time in 20 years that would happen. Uh, cutting down the nets had to be so special for you, Chris, and for you as well, Coach, to do that at Cole Fieldhouse. Man, it was it was big for me, you know, because like like I said, for me coming, it's going all the way to the final four, being able to see that, and then you know starting off, you know, getting ready to go into the uh, the tournament, winning the ACC tournament, you know, all that was just you know that's what we wanted, you know, that was the motivation, that's what we worked hard for, and all that. So you know, for us to get that, to be able to cut them nets down, man, it was big because we was we had a special year that year. And coach, at that time, you guys are twenty five and three. Yeah, we had, um, you know, we were, we were a good basketball team. It was, it was simple as that. You know, we, we had, and the three losses were to uh, Arizona, um, who was a very good basketball team, Oklahoma at Oklahoma, and which I take full responsibility for that loss because we scheduled that thing to uh, kind of uh, appease television because we had beaten Oklahoma the year before in Cole. We had to go and return that game. The only date we had was like the day after exams were over at Maryland. And I don't think the players were ready because Oklahoma was good. Kelvin Sampson was a great coach and they were very physical out there. And we just, we, we needed like three or four more practices before we could have done a better job out there. But, you know, once again, though, the timing of that was pretty good because that was right before the ACC regular season started. And if we had any idea that we didn't have to work hard, uh, that that game certainly took care of that. So it, it turned out that uh, that was probably one of those losses that really helped us as the season went on. Everybody knows what a special player Juan Dixon was as a teammate, Chris, and as a guy to coach Gary. And in his four years, he won 110 games, part of 110 victories, and winning at least 25 in each of his four years at Maryland. Not only a great teammate, I'm sure, for you, Chris, but, Coach, I remember when he – I came out early in the season. Maybe he was practicing, and I said, who's this skinny kid, 6'3", 145 pounds from Baltimore? Can he be able to hold up in the in the rigors of playing in the ACC? And I think you said, yeah, just watch. Yeah, I, I remember when we signed him. Um, he went to Calvert Hall in Baltimore, and uh, I was criticized in both of the two newspapers that covered us for uh, signing a guy that wasn't – as you said, big enough to play in the ACC at the guard position. And like, I never, that never bothered me, you know, the size of uh, people, um, you know, cause I, I had coached a guy at Boston college named Michael Adams. He was about, he played for the uh, wizards uh, eventually in town, made the NBA all-star team. He was probably five ten and a half, five eleven, And that was when Georgetown had, you know, Ewing, Chris Mullen was at St. John's, you know, all the great players in the big East back then. And he just, he was one of them, you know, he, he just, he had no fear. Uh, he would kill you if he had to, to win a game. And, you know, Juan had that same attitude. I remember seeing Juan play on an AAU team in the summertime. He was in a gym. It was the Peach Jam down in, um, in South Carolina. And 
Juan's team was losing by 20 with about two minutes left, and it was a loose ball, and he dove on the floor for a loose ball like it was a, a championship game. And that just convinced me because I knew he could score. You know, if you can score, you can score. You know, I, I've always thought that you hear people say, well, that's all he could do was shoot the ball. Well, that wasn't all he could do. But if you can shoot the ball, that's a good thing. You know, that, that's, that's a great thing in basketball. And Juan brought everything to the table. He, he brought a great practice work ethic. Uh, he brought willingness to shoot after practice, um, try to get better. And uh, he had a great um, mental approach to the game where he had, he had a chip on his shoulder and he was a little cocky, but he used it in a very positive way. And he, he was just very difficult to guard. Plus, I had Chris Wilcox. Uh, Lonnie Baxter, uh, Taj Holden, Ryan Randall as his bodyguards. So if any, anybody messed with a 170-pound guy, they had to talk to a 250-pound guy. So that, that always worked out pretty well. Chris, what was yeah. he like as a teammate? Man, Juan was Juan was a great dude, man. Juan taught me work ethic, you know what I mean? Because, like, every day after, after uh, practice, he would be shooting, right? Then you would come through there later on in the afternoon or something, maybe between classes, you'll walk through the gym and you'll see Juan in there getting some shots up. And then this one I knew, I was like, you know what? We got a special team. It came to a point in time where all the guys was coming in there getting extra shots up. You know, big man, I was working on my body trying to get 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 more weight on and things like that with Curtis. Um, like every guy was like doing their part, man. So that's what made it so special. And then my job was to get Juan open because if Juan get open, then I get open. You know what I mean? So if he can't <laughs> if he can't knock down his shot, he can drop it off to me. You know what I mean? So my goal was to make sure that Juan got all the touches that he needed. You know what I mean? <laughs> Chris, I, I, I thought you were just screening because you were a good guy. You know? No, listen, I, I, I listen. I was trying to get him over because if he gets two <laughs> shots off, I know they're gonna true. jump, and then I can get me a little stuff. Well, you know what I mean? <laughs> hey, Chris, you, you remember the curl play, right? When, when you screen down, Juan would curl over top of you, and if your man helped at all on Juan when he caught it, he'd dump it down to you. Okay, that that was a great play we had that year. But that's why I had to return the. That's why I always return the favor. I make sure I don't mess up on none of his plays, so he don't mess up on none of mine. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Lonnie, let's let's get your thoughts about Juan as a teammate. Oh, Juan is one of the most uh, hardworking. Um, Juan, great shooter, uh, great defender. Uh, Juan is just one of those guys that just won't be denied. Like um, you can hit him, knock him down, he's going to keep coming at you. Um, he's just one of those guys that's very relentless. Um, I mean, he's probably the most decorated Terrapin in the history of, of Maryland basketball. Um, just all of his accomplishments, you know, I mean, what he means to the state of Maryland, to the program, to the university. Um, Juan is just, just one of those special talents, you know, that meant so much to our basketball team, to every player, his, you know, the camaraderie we had, um, you know, the, the willingness to fight back all the time. I, we get a lot of that from Juan because he was just one of those guys that just never gave up. In the NCAA tournament, you got a number one ranking in the East. The uh, first time you've ever been ranked number one coach in the in the NCAA tournament, pre, pre-tournament. You hosted Siena at MCI. You beat them 85-70. Second game, Wisconsin up next. Dixon had 29. You easily put away the Badgers. You, you crushed them 87-57. And then off to the Sweet 16 for the fourth time in five years. And you had to be feeling pretty good about your chances based on those first two games. Well, the, the problem, uh, when we got to the regionals up in Syracuse, um, Connecticut, we, we played Kentucky and Connecticut. And uh, Kentucky had a very good coach, very good friend of mine from the state of Maryland, in fact, uh, Tubby Smith. And I knew Tubby for 30 years, and I knew how tough he was in terms of getting his team to play. And they had a player, a great player named Tayshawn Prince that played the NBA a long time. And, you know, he was very good. And I knew that was going to be a tough game. And everybody had already started to talk about, well, if we win that game and Connecticut wins, that's the game we want to see, you know, for the uh, regional final. But I knew the Kentucky game was going to be tough. And we, we had to grind that game. Uh, we really grinded that game. It was never a big lead, anything like that. And, I was really proud of our players because, uh, you know, a team like Kentucky, they had, they had won national championships before. They didn't have that monkey on their back about, you know, n- never had won one before. So we had to get through that game. And 
you know, we, we worked hard to, to win that game. And we had good focus. We, we weren't worried about the next game. We knew we had to win that game. And you beat Kentucky by 10. Lonnie, you and Chris combined for 31 points in that game. What are your memories about that? Um, go ahead, Chris. Look, look, man, man, look, I just I just speed off of Lonnie. You know what I mean? When Lonnie get it down there, I tell Lonnie, listen, when you get it down there, just put it up. I'm, I got your back. Because they're going to double team you, and then I'm going to be wide open on the other side. So just throw it up to the rim, whatever the case may be. I got you. So me and Lonnie, we, we worked together down there. We had some, we, you know what I mean? We had some, we had moments to where we just, we just locked in together, man. And we looked out for one another. You know what I'm saying? His guy beat him. I got him. And it was vice versa. I always could depend on Lonnie being the right place at the right time. You know what I mean? So he made my job easy. So I tried every time I could to make sure his job was easy too. So like I said, we practiced so hard and we, we went at it so hard all the time, man. It wasn't nothing for us to go in the game and just, and just play hard, you know, and compete. So it, it, it was good because, I knew that I had Lonnie on my squad, we was going to win. You know what I mean? Um, to feed off of that, uh, yeah, Chris uh, Chris didn't play a lot during his freshman year. So um, in his sophomore year in 2002, he was able to surprise a lot of people because people didn't really see him that much his freshman year. Um, and his athleticism, uh, it was just off the charts. Uh, great hands, really big hands, could rebound, um, excellent jumper. Uh, he really came out and intimidated a lot of people with his athleticism and his size. So our front court, you know, along with Taj Holden, um, we just came in and we just tried to, you know, just beat people down. I mean, me with my I was never really a tall player, but I had the body and the size and the footwork. I could really, you know, um, in college, you know, there weren't too many guys that were stronger than me. And I was just able to, you know, just beat guys up down low. Chris was there to, to follow up. Uh, when I got doubled, I looked for him on the baseline. And we, we were just amazing. The way me, Chris, and Taj Holden played, you know, in that front court, it was just amazing. When one of us, you know, um, had to pick up the slack, if I got in foul trouble or Chris got in foul trouble, you know, Taj Holden was able to come in, give us big minutes, and he could stretch the floor you know, and shoot a lot of threes. So uh, it, it was just an amazing front court we had with that duo. Did Coach also, Lonnie, getting MVP honors for not one but two regionals? Yeah, I think that that uh, kind of separates Lonnie from a lot of players, you know, to achieve that because when you get to the regional level, there's so many good players uh, in, a, in a region. Uh, you know, they, they, you know, they're into Sweet 16. They, they've proven how, how good they are. And, and it didn't surprise me because when Lonnie, Lonnie had – his game. He was going to play his game. You couldn't take him out of his game. His game was a power game. It was a post-up game. Uh, he had very, I don't think Lonnie ever got the credit for the moves he had inside. People think, well, he was big and strong. He just take it to the basket. Well, it doesn't work that way. You know, people scout you, they defend you. You have to adjust a lot of times on the fly. And uh, Lonnie, one thing, I wish you wouldn't have had reminded Chris that he didn't play it a lot his freshman year because I was hoping Chris forgot that before the reunion, but it looks like uh, you brought it up. So uh, Sorry, uh, I remember coach. I remember coach. Yeah, I know. It, I know. It, it all <laughs> so when you get, when you get to the regional championship for the second year in a row, you got a rematch with UConn, number two seed in the East back and forth all night long, 24 lead changes, 21 ties in the game. You got a big basket from Blake with about, 15 or 20 seconds to go in that game, and you win it by a score of 90-82. That sends you off to Atlanta at a second straight Final Four appearance. But when you look back at the teams that you went through to get to that point, that was incredible. Yeah, that uh, Connecticut game, uh, that was as good a game. You know, I coached 43 years, whatever. That, that was as good a game I was ever involved with. There, there were eight future NBA players on the court at the same time, and that game was so quick. Uh, it was incredible. You, you really were just reacting to everything that happened at both ends of the court. And, you know, it was just great to be a part of it and, and to be able to coach a game like that. And, um, we, we had to really gut it out that game. I mean, Connecticut, to their credit, they, they gave us uh, a really good shot. Karam Butler had 26. And Byron Mouton was as good of like a swing defensive man. He could play a big guy. He could play a guard as I ever coached. And Byron just could not shun the shut down Karan Butler. Of course, we, we told uh, Byron that uh, Karan, make sure he didn't get to the basket. He's not a very good outside shooter. Well, he didn't miss an outside shot in the second half. But, yeah. you know, like you said, we had two guys step up and 
make big shots. But at the same time, you know, guys like Lonnie and Chris and, you know, Todd Holden kept us in the game where those guys could take shots that would make a big difference in the outcome of the game. And, and Coach, when you get to the semifinal game against Kansas, Lonnie got in foul trouble in that game. You found yourself down 13-2. to two. At that point, what was the message to these guys? Well, uh, you know, it's not the way you want to start, obviously, but at the same time, I think we were mature enough as a team to understand we hadn't even gotten to the first TV timeout yet, so there was still – you know, 36, 37 minutes left in the game. And we knew we had time to come back, and we knew we were good. And so we came out of the huddle. I think Juan hit a three, and then we made another three, I think, on a three-point player. Juan hit another shot. So all of a sudden, there's 13 to eight. And, you know, that's anybody's game now. And I, and I think that was the key that, you know, the, the only good teams can, you know, you, you get hit in the face once in a while. There, there, there's no question about it. Teams make shots you don't think they're going to make, and you have to overcome that. And we never lost our confidence or our poise in that situation. And I, I, I say this all the time from about the 10 minute mark in the uh, first half to uh, about the first 10 minutes of the second half. That's the best basketball, uh, you know, I've ever coached because Kansas was really, really good. They were ranked number one in the country most, most of the year. They had a couple of pros running around on their team and Roy Williams was their coach who knows what he's doing. And so we, we had the really, do everything right to get the shots that we got because we scored, you know, you scored 90 some points in a, a semifinal game of the NCAA tournament at the final four. Nobody does that. You know, I, I, don't, I don't think the team ever got credit for that game. Like how well, how well we played and, and Kansas made a run at us. We, we had to come back a little bit. Uh, they, were, they were making a run down the stretch. And, you know, we, we had to fight really hard to win that game. 97-88, you beat them in that game. And despite Lonnie being in foul trouble, Chris, you and Taj Holden combined for 31 points in that win. But Johnny, look, before that game, they said that uh, uh, Drew and uh, Nick, they had a, uh, they said that they was the best two big men in the country and all this and, and that and the third, right? So we like, okay, cool. So I think Gary might have showed us that, me and Lonnie that or something like, oh, they're the best two big men in the country, all this. Okay, cool. I told Lonnie for the game, we're going to bust their ass today. You know what I mean? You know what I'm saying? And that's what we did, Johnny. You know what I mean? And I, like, like I said, man, me and Lonnie, we had a relationship, man, that we fought hard every day in practice. Like I said, Sleepy and and uh, Ryan Randall and uh, Taj, they pushed us hard every day. But, man, when we got to that point right there, that was that same position we was in the year before when we lost to Duke. We weren't going to let that happen again this year. You know what I mean? So what we did was we fought. We put everything in. And like I said, when one man down, you know, another man step up. So that's what Taj did. And that's what we did for each other. Chris, in that game, you blocked early on. You blocked – it was either Collison or uh, Gooden shot. You, like, knocked it out to half court. And I don't think that ever happened to those two guys. You know, they, they, they were like, what's this? You know, this is something different. We haven't seen this. And I think that kind of set the tone when we went on a run. Uh, you know, they, they got shook. There, there was no doubt about it. So then you go on to the championship game against Indiana. They'd won five national championships – Maryland looking for their first ever national championship. And you're facing a team coach that had tradition. They had long, had great coaches. They had great players down through the years. And uh, everybody was saying, well, it's going to be an upset if Maryland can win this game. Indiana was favored to win the game. And you shut them up like that. Well, I, I think until you win it, you, you don't get the same respect as schools that have yeah. won it before. So, okay, that, that's fine. But I knew we were a better team. I think the team, Chris and Lonnie could speak to that better, but I don't know if I showed it, but in, in, in my heart, I knew we were a better basketball team. And I would have been the most disappointed person, you know, probably for the rest of my life if we would have lost that game because we were better. We, we had better players. Uh, we, we had won more big games during the year. All, all those things were in our favor. And, you know, it, it was a shame from one standpoint. The, the one thing it showed, was how good we were defensively. We held them under 50 till they threw in a, like a 30-footer with two seconds left uh, in the game. They had four, 49 points. And then the other thing was we just couldn't play well offensively. It was one of those games that you, don't, you hope you don't see them in the NCAA tournament, but we did. But we were good enough to win a game where we didn't play great offensively. Lolly, your thoughts about that national championship game? Um, 
you can see it on our face. There was a lot of nerves going on, you know, from the year before. Um, uh, it, it was it was a really uh, I remember feeling like I was on cloud nine. It took me a while to come back down. That's why, you know, we started off the game. It was kind of a, a messy game, a lot of missed shots. Um, I mean, you can see we were playing hard, but it took us a while to come back down to, to earth, you know, to really execute and do what we had to do to, to finish the game. Because I remember the first half was kind of like a blur to me, um, you know, um, being in Atlanta, the Atlanta Dome. Um, <laughs> It was so many fans there. Um, I mean, it's, it's the biggest crowd I've ever played in front of. Um, and you know, the national championship. This is this is your dream. This is your shot right here. Um, and all we could think about was just making it to the buzzer. And I just remember Juan throwing the ball up in the air after we won. And <laughs> after that, it was just a huge celebration. You know, we had finally did it. You know, um, being playing at the University of Maryland for four years. Um, you know, being coached. By Coach Williams, you know, I mean, it was just a dream come true. Um, and still to this day, uh, you know, I sell cars, you know, people come into the car dealership and to this day, they're still like, thank you. Thank you so much for what you did for us, you know, and people to this day, they still love that team, you know, because we were able to win a national championship for the University of Maryland, for the state of Maryland, you know, for our home fans. Um, <laughs> to me, it's still the, the greatest feeling in the world. Chris, as you think back almost 20 years ago, as you approached that game, did you sit there in the locker room saying to yourself, look what we've just done. Look, look how far we've come. We have one more game to win, and we're national champions. Man, man, I had so many, my nerves, everything. I was just, you know, it was crazy because, like, it was just a bunch of relief, too, saying, like, oh, we're here now, you know? And uh, once we... Once we got out there on the court, man, it was just like, like, like Lonnie said, it was just a bunch of, you know, the game was real messy because we, we, our, our emotions was just caught up in the game, but it was just a great feeling, you know, at the end of the game, you know, when we found out, we finally realized like, look, man, we just tighten up, let's get this done and we can be national champs, man. When we locked in and things started rolling, man, it was a great feeling, man. I just, I remember coming off the court and I just, you know, I always, you know, I always see walk by Gary because I know he gonna say something. You know what I mean. So this time, man, it was just you know it was just a bunch of relief, man. You know I just you know just grabbed him, just told him just man, thank you, man, because man, little kid like me from Whiteville being able to be on the national stage like that, winning the national championship, man. You know, and then doing being his, you know, going undefeated at Cold Field House, man, where it's 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 it's, it's history there being a part of all that history that same year man it was a beautiful thing for me man and i wouldn't trade that for nothing man i i appreciate every for the university of maryland for what they've done for us for our families to be able to witness this you know what i'm saying witness that too so it was just a great feeling man and at the end of when that game when that buzzer went off man i was just that was just a big thing of relief for me man because we had went through a lot that year you know with mouton going through some things with his family you know what i mean and it was, it, that year just meant a whole lot to us, man. So, man, I was just happy to be able to accomplish that, man, and then share it with my brothers. And for those who may have forgotten, Lonnie Baxter in that game, 15 points, uh, had 12 rebounds. Juan Dixon with 18. Steve Blake had six. He also had about five assists in that game. Four for Byron Mouton. Chris had 10 points in that national championship game. And off the bench, everybody scored, Coach. Drew Nicholas with seven and Todd Holden with two and Ryan Randall. You only played eight guys in that championship game. And I will remember sitting there with Chris Knockies. We're broadcasting the game, and I can feel myself with the emotions um, kind of building up inside of, <clears throat> inside of me. I can only imagine what it was like for you, Coach. John, was John what was incredible was uh, after everything settled down, I got a chance to watch it. And your call at the end of the game was – Incredible. You know, when Juan threw the ball in the air, you you uh, you had a sense for, for what it was. And you said, and the kids have done it. Dixon fires it up to the top of the Georgia Dome roof, and the kids have done it. Maryland wins their first ever national championship. Yep, because it's funny, as time goes by, you still think of, you know, Chris at 19, you know, Lonnie at 21, 22 years old, you know, the same, they, they, they were kids, you know, they're, they're still kids at that point. And to do what they did was incredible. And uh, you really captured it. So congratulations on that. 
you go back to the hotel after the game. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, or you try to go back to the hotel after the game. I'll never forget that in the lobby of that hotel. I'll never forget, and Coach, when we got in the bus and when we landed at BWI with the fire trucks out there on the runway spraying the plane, and then the bus coming down 95 with cars pulled off on the side of the road and people applauding and cheering, it, it was it's something I will never forget. Yeah, that, that's they're, they're the things that I think as you get older, you know, they, they you, you think about them a little more. I'll, I'll be driving my car yeah. somewhere and all of a sudden a, a play pops into my mind from, you know, a regional game that year and things like that happen. But th those things, they they don't happen because you have to be really talented to get to that level. But just being really talented doesn't win those games. You have to have a group that are willing to sacrifice for each other, put up with a coach that yelled a lot, you know, that, that type of thing. And they did all those things and they earned the right to win the championship. The players earned the right to win the championship. And that's the way it works. Nobody gives you anything. You earn the right. And what they did their whole careers, but this specifically that year, that gave them the right to win that championship. It also might have been the first time ever that a team has won a national championship without a McDonald's high school All-American on that team. Yeah, I always wondered about that. You know, I don't know what they picked. Say they picked 15 guys in that McDonald's All-American team. Give me the next, next 15 and we'll go play and see who wins. You know, I, that, that always bothered me. And Ryan Randall had the line of the year when he, when he said to the media well, after practice or something, he said, yeah, we don't have any McDonald's All-Americans. We got Burger King All-Americans. And I... Stole that from Ryan, used it for a lot of bank that year. Yeah, well, that's, just, that's just a testament. Like what I said earlier, Coach Williams was always able to get the best out of his players. Um, no matter who he coached, you know, whether it was a uh, Grievous Vasquez, Steve Blake, Chris Wilcox, uh, Laron Prophet, Sarunas, Yasakunas, Joe Smith, Steve Francis, Coach Williams was always able to do more with less. And that's why, you know, he's regarded as, you know, he doesn't get enough credit. But, you know, to me, he's the greatest coach ever because of, you know, what he did at Maryland with the talent that he had, you know, not going after big names. You know, um, we're a bunch of, you know, coming into Maryland, a lot of unknown names, and we left national champions. So hats off the coach. Thanks. You got, you got some final comments, Chris? Yeah, man. I, like I say, man, coach, man, you, you know, that I appreciate everything, man. You, you, you basically helped me become a, you know, mature, become a man. And, and, and basically the responsibility thing was big because like, you know, I never had as many responsibilities, like from going to college, from high school to college, man, it, it was, it was, it was major. And I never forget one time I had got, uh, I had got hit in the lip. Right. And, um, uh, I went over there. I'm like, oh, man, I got to get stitches, and I'm feeling sorry, right? And coach like, man, come on, man, Harry, we need you back in practice. We're getting ready to go to the playoffs. We need you back in practice, right? So I'm like, <laughs> all right, you know, I'm taking my time, you know what I'm saying, blah, blah. So, look, I go down and get my stitches. Next thing you know, uh, the ball boy come down and say, hey, uh, Gary said you need to hurry up. I'm like, I'm getting stitched up, you know what I'm saying? He's like, no, nah, you need to hurry up because you need to know these plays and stuff like that because we was preparing to go to the Final Four, you know what I mean? That was the first year, you know what I mean? So, you know, like – all that stuff meant something to me because it was like, man, this guy really wants to win. You know, he need and every every piece of the puzzle has to be together. You know what I'm saying? And like for me, man, I didn't understand it, man, but that was all part of the strategy to wanting to win and all that, man. And it was just like, listen, man, understand, you know, put that what you got on your mind. You you might have something on you, but listen, man, just accomplish something bigger than that. And the bigger thing for me was basketball. That's all I, I ever dreamed of, man. And you was able to capture that and 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 help me get to where I needed to be. I was able to provide stuff for my family, take my family places that they would only imagine. You know what I mean? I got to the next level, man, and it's all thanks to you, man. And I want to tell you, I appreciate you. You know what I'm saying? I appreciate the school. I appreciate the organization. Lonnie, you know how we roll. You know what I'm saying? You're always my guy. You know what I'm saying? And I appreciate you because you was a senior at that time, bringing me up under your wing from day one. You know what I'm saying? Teaching me like a little brother. Put me on the go-go, man. I appreciate you. You know what I'm saying? So, man, I appreciate everything. The Merlin family. Johnny, man, always, man, the support that you always gave, man. I just appreciate everything and all the memories, man. I love y'all, man. Real family. That's Please. great, Chris. Thank you. Thank you, Chris Wilcox. Thanks to Lonnie Baxter. And, Coach, I don't think people 
understand how difficult it is to coach any team in basketball, whatever it may be, basketball, softball, baseball, football, how difficult it is to get the right blend of guys to blend together to have the same goal. And it's not easy. If it was easy, you'd win the national championship the next year. It's not easy. Yeah. To accomplish it's not easy. Yeah. It, it becomes easier uh, when you have good people. And sure. I think if, if, you know, like Lonnie and Chris are just good examples on that team. Uh, of the people they were as players, both, you know, NBA players, you know, having good careers in the NBA, but the type of people they are away from the basketball court. And the, the one thing about coaching, you, you, you're, you're forced to get to know everybody. They get to know you as a coach. You get to know them as people. And, you know, those things start coming together. You know, you start really enjoying the time that you spend with them even though it can be tough at times to practice and things like that, there's no place I would rather be that year than with a team, you know, and it was just, that's the way that thing grows. And all of a sudden it's us against the world and yep. we'll go play anybody anywhere, but you better bring your best shot because we're, we're going to bring our best shot. And the best shot was in 2001, 2002, Maryland wins the national championship. Thanks to Chris Wilcox. Thanks to Lonnie Baxter. Thanks to Coach Gary Williams. We're going to take a break. We're going to come back. And keep in mind, these two guys, plus all the other members of that national championship team, save for uh, Earl Badu and, and God rest his soul, will be coming back to Xfinity Center on the 27th for that game against Ohio State. They'll all be honored on that particular day to recognize this national championship team. We're going to take a break, and uh, Katie and Mike are going to take over. We'll come back and be fielding your questions to some of these guys uh, in just a couple of minutes. Enjoy. You could see the emotion that season still generates all these years later. And if you're a Terps fan, you gotta get a little choked up too. Thanks to our terrific panel for taking us back to one of the greatest moments in local sports history. And thanks to our program sponsor, the Jacklich Law Group, and to superfans Bob and Elaine Pevenstein. And to the board, staff, and volunteers whose efforts make programming like this possible. Preserving our sports heritage is made possible by contributions from viewers like you. If you've tuned into our show tonight, consider making a donation to the Babe Ruth Museum. We'll be joining our live Q&A with Gary Williams and Johnny Holiday in just a few minutes.